All right, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for this wonderful day which you have made. I just pray, Lord, that when I open my mouth wide, you fill it. And Father God, I thank you for leading the people to the sermon who need to hear it, Lord, and help us all to be doers and not just hearers only, deceiving our own self. Open our eyes, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts that obey and listen to you. And I thank you, Lord, for blessing this word as it goes forth, and let it be your word, Lord, and not mine. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. The light of the body of the eye. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. Matthew 6, 22 to 23. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness. So many of us struggle with darkness these days. It's so prevalent to where our eyes are at. And we see how this darkness is in the government, in our entertainment, in our education, in the food, etc., etc. And when we look at it, we start thinking about it. We start pondering on it, meditating on it. And then we get depressed and we get fearful and anxious and we can't seem to get victory over all the negative emotions that flood our bodies. I've struggled with this. And when I've asked God, why? Why do I vacillate between joy and absolute depression? Why between hope and absolute despondency? And this is one of the verses that he constantly quickens to me. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? In other words, if my eye were singly fixed, then my whole body would finally be full of light. But what should my eyes, my focus, my meditation, my attention be fixed on? What is this light that God is talking about that will flood my body? John 8 verse 12 says, Then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 12, 35 to 36. Then Jesus said unto them, Yet a little while is the light with you. Walk while ye have the light, lest darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. While ye have light, believe in the light, that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed. Right here we have our answer. Jesus is the light. So when the word of God says, If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light, that means that God wants us to be singly eye fixed on him, on Jesus Christ, the light of the world. So when we meditate on Jesus and all he's done for us and his goodness and his mercy and his word, our body is full of light. We have hope, we have peace, joy, strength, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance, and we're shining with his beauty and his righteousness. But how do we deliberately get our eyes on Jesus to where we can have this light flooding our body? Well, one way we can meditate on him is by reminding ourselves in the face of everything that we go up against what Jesus has done for us. Psalm 77, verses 11 to 12 says, I will remember the works of the Lord. Surely I will remember thy wonders of old. I will meditate also of all thy work and talk of thy doings. Psalm 77, 11, 12. So in the face of the hardships and trials which we come against, and we will continue to come against them, we need to purposely go out of our way to remind ourselves of what he has done for us. That's what David was doing when he was talking about, I will remember the works of the Lord in spite of everything he went through. And for myself, I will write down in a journal what God has done for me, how he has answered prayers for me, how he has brought me through, all the verses and the words of encouragement and the dreams that he has given to me to encourage me or even correct me or guide me on this path. And I will write down all the miracles that he has done for me and my family. And so that way when I struggle with going through doubt, despondency, fear, or when the devil whispers and says that God won't answer you, or so on and so forth, I will open that journal and I will read those stories and remind myself of how good God is and I will meditate on his goodness. Because if I 
if we do not do this and instead we keep our eyes on all the negative things happening around us, all the evil that is in our lives and that we have to fight against, then these things will flood us with darkness. They'll fill us with worry, anxiety, anxiety bitterness, fear, sorrow, depression. And you know what? This can happen in one instant. One moment, you can be worshiping God and saying, thank you, Lord, I'm alive, you take care of us, you come through for us, and the very next moment, you can hear somebody say something or hear a news report or experience something in your life, and all of a sudden, your eyes are no longer on Jesus, and you end up with your eyes on the dark things happening around you. If something goes wrong, just like the other day, I was cooking cakes, and two of them seemed to be straight in a row where it would not get cooked all the way through. And I had to really fight to get my eyes back on Jesus, to tell myself it will be okay, to have peace in Christ. And you know what? Like I said, I knew the moment I got my eyes off of Jesus because I lost my peace. And a lot of times, this is how we can tell right away if our eyes are on Jesus or they're on something or someone else. The Word of God says in Isaiah 26, 3-4, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. I love to sing this song frequently to myself, and it's the go-to tune that I constantly start humming in the car to where even my family has memorized it. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Isaiah 26, 3, 2, for. So if our mind, our eyes, our attention is stayed on Jesus and trusting in him, then we will have perfect peace. I remember writing in my journal as if God were speaking to me, saying, Stephanie, if you don't have perfect peace, it's because you're not trusting in me. And I believe that's the truth for the majority of us. If we don't have perfect peace, it's because we're not keeping our eyes on Jesus. We're not trusting in him to take care of us. It's because we've allowed other things, worries, anxieties, fears to become bigger to us than God, even our own shortcomings. Our eyes have become so focused on the evils around us that it's flooding our minds and our bodies with darkness. And as such, we end up bitter, downcast, depressed, sorrowful, anger, despondent, fearful, and it's not long before that darkness will rob all of God's light from our lives, all of Jesus' hope and, and his goodness from, ours, from our body. Think about the Israelites. They're such an amazing example that we still read about thousands of years later. God saved them from the Egyptians. They were slaves. They were in bondage to sin. They were being used to build the pyramids and all the other buildings. They didn't have rest. They didn't have peace. And God says, I will deliver you. And he did so with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. He caused all of the plagues to come through, the locust, the three days of darkness, the river being turned to blood, and the cattle dying, and the hail that was burning with fire falling from the sky, and even the firstborn dying. And he says, I will bring you out. Out. And so finally they get to the Red Sea and there God splits the water for them. An amazing miracle. And then he drowns the powerful Egyptian army, the horses, the chariots, and they're swept away in the waters of the Red Sea. And they get to the other side and they have all these miracles and how God came through for them over and over and over. And yet, no matter how incredibly God came through for them. They refused to put their eyes on God and say, I trust in you. Instead, the momentary was all that mattered to them. Their hardships, their trials, the lack of food, the lack of water, being out in the hot sun, that's all that mattered. And they dwelled on that wickedness and it flooded their bodies with darkness and they whined and they complained because they refused to remind themselves that 
God did all of this for us, and surely, surely he'll continue to take care of us. Oh, how easy it is for us to fall into the same thing, to where God has done mighty miracles for us. He has answered prayers. We've seen his hand at work in our lives, and yet when the trials come, when the hardships arise, when things don't turn out quite right, we're so quick to get our eyes on those things instead of Christ. And all of a sudden, our bodies are full of darkness, our mind is full of tribulation, turbulation, and we're full of doubt. And instead of putting our trust in God, we let fear, pride, bitterness, doubt, and selfishness rule in our hearts. Again, that's what the Israelites did. God told them, go into the promised land. I will be with thee. I will defeat your foes for you. Do not be afraid. Go where I have sent you to go. But the Israelites said, no, we will not trust in you. Our eyes are on all those giants in the land, on how they will eat us for bread. And the Israelites and the spies, the ten evil ones, decided their problems were too big for God to handle, too big for God to do anything about. And they said in their undoubt and disbelief in letting that evil darkness flood their bodies that anybody who disagreed with them, they would stone them. They would stone Caleb and Joshua and they would assign themselves new leaders and go back to Egypt. And we need to watch that. We don't do the same thing. Hebrews 3, 12 to 19 says, Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. While it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation. For some, when they had heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. But with whom was he grieved for forty years? Was it not with them that sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness, and to whom he sware that he, they would not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. They could not enter in. The Israelites could not go into God's promises, his promised land, because of unbelief. And if we let our eyes be full of darkness, of doubt and fear and worry and sin, we could end up missing out on all God's promises. Instead, we need to keep our eyes singly fixed on Jesus Christ and trust that he'll come through. Remind ourselves of everything he's done and everything he will do. We need to meditate constantly on his word. Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart. For I am called by thy name, O Lord, God of hosts. First Timothy 4, 15 says, Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them, that thy profiting may appear to all. And then Joshua 1, 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And Proverbs 4.20, My son, attend to my words, incline thine ear unto my sayings, let them not depart from thine eyes. Keep them in the midst of thine heart, for they are life unto those that find them, and health to all their flesh. So many times we leave this extremely paramount and important information out of our sermons and our messages that we need to meditate on the word of God, that we need to plant his seed into our hearts. I just watched a Christian woman who has five children and she talks about how she'll write scriptures on postcards and she'll put it on her mirrors and she'll put it on certain doorposts and when she's exercising she'll lay it on her doormat and then she'll meditate on those scriptures like a dog chews on a bone. That's amazing and that is something that we should be doing. We should be meditating on those scriptures. 
She is planting seed in her heart, and it will not return unto her void. So picture this. You've prepared this beautiful plot of land. You've ripped out all the weeds. You've removed all the stones. You've plowed it. You put fertilizer on it. You water it. You pray over it. You even stand there and you speak tongues over that plot of land. And you're standing there for month after month after month, and you're praying over this plot of land, and you're watering it, and you're fertilizing it, and nothing good is coming up. Well, what in the world? There's no watermelon, no tomatoes, no green beans, okra, no corn, and you're even speaking in tongues for four hours a day, and yet nothing good is coming out of that plot of land. But why in the world? Why? Is it well, maybe it's God's fault at that point because I'm doing all these things. No, let me tell you what you're missing. You know what you forgot to do? You forgot to put the seeds in the garden. And Jesus spent three years planting seed, his word, into his disciples' hearts. And they went on to bear much fruit in their lives. My own life, I was a Christian or a lukewarm Christian for over 20 plus years, but I was in bondage to sin. I was reading romance books and all kinds of stuff I shouldn't have been reading. And I was depressed. I had no hope for the future. And I went to church three days every week. And I'd been doing that for 20 plus years. And I, I prayed to God and I wanted to serve him, but I couldn't get all the good fruit. I couldn't get free. And you know what? It wasn't until my dad published a book called My Daily Meditations, full of verses that he encouraged me to memorize. And I said, Dad, I've opened it, and I, I can't seem to get it. Blessed is a, I can't seem to memorize it. And he said, put a tune to it. And that's what I did. And so the very first one I did was, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water, that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Psalm 1, 1 to 3. And that, that first verse, was the first step in absolutely transforming my life. I started putting the seed of God's word in my heart through music. And I started reaping a bounteous harvest where God delivered me step by slow step from the things of the world, where God gave me his dreams, his visions, his hope, his peace, and he started revealing to me where I had swallowed the lies of the devil. And I couldn't see that before because I was too blinded by the darkness in my body because my mind, my heart, my eyes was not on Jesus Christ. And so many of us, we are in the same place. We want to bear fruit. We want to be transformed and changed, but we're not actively meditating and hiding the word of God in our hearts. And the Bible warns us that we are to protect our heart. And he says, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Proverbs 4, verse 23. But instead of keeping our heart with diligence, I see so many people do this, and I have been guilty, where we get our hearts and our minds off of God, and then we start focusing on everything but him. In fact, we'll even treat our minds like they're trash bins and we'll pour in tons of worldly videos and entertainment, news and negative stories, fantasy books and games, things that inspire lust, greed and covetousness in us. And we cannot kid ourselves when we do this. We can't say, well, I watch all this stuff, but it doesn't influence me and it's not affecting me. What I, what I do doesn't change how, what I am. Don't kid yourself. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he reap. For he that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. When you're doing those things, you're not planting the word of God in your garden that you're praying over. 
In fact, you are planting weeds in there, weeds that are noxious and that have poison in them, and they will sprout and they will bear their fruit, and you don't want that in your life. In fact, those things, they will choke out the word of God. They will rob your hunger from him. They will distract you from Jesus Christ, and they will cause you to be lukewarm and double-minded. Now, there are things that will weeds that will blow into our garden, problems, trials, tribulations, but even in them, we need to say, Lord, I'm just through you. I'm going to just pluck this right out and keep my eyes on you. This weed is not bigger than you, and I'm removing it by faith. I cast my problems at your feet, Jesus. I know that you will take care of me. First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. And Matthew 11, 28 to 30 says, come unto me, O ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find Find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Matthew eleven twenty eight to thirty. God loves us and we can trust in Him. We need to cast those cares, those fears and anxieties at His feet and find our rest in Him. But that takes faith in Jesus. And one of the ways we develop that faith is found in, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17. Right there, it goes right back to the word of God. Right there, it goes back to hiding the seed of God in our heart and how hiding that seed will bring about faith in our lives. And that brings us back to our eye being single. We need to be hearing the word of God, reading the word of God, speaking the word of God over our lives, singing it, meditating on it, and that is being singly eyed, fixed. And in that, our faith will grow. So that way when the trials come, our body will not be filled with darkness. We won't be full of fear and worry and anxiety, depression and doubt because we will fight that with the word of God. We'll take up that shield of faith that we developed by hiding the word of God in our heart. Ephesians 6 verse 16 says, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So let's imagine a bowl of water. It's like our mind, and that water is dirty. And so we're reading the word of God, and that dirt starts disappearing because the Bible says about taking and cleaning our minds with the washing of the water of the word. And But then imagine that we take a little teaspoon or a big tablespoon, and we would start dribbling dirt, dumping dirt in there, and then we get really surprised when our water is not getting clear. Why isn't it getting clean, even though we are reading the Bible and we're going to church, we're reading our Bible, we're listening to a Bible plan. In fact, I'm spending an hour with God every single day, and yet why is not my water getting and staying clean? Well, I have to ask them hard questions that I have to frequently ask myself. What movies and TV programs are we watching? What topics are we constantly discussing? Because that shows you where our heart is. What news are we partaking in? And what's running in our minds 24-7? Ephesians 5, 11 to 12 says, And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. For it is a shame to even speak of those things which are done in secret. And Romans 8, verse 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Romans 8, 6. Remember, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So if we want our mind, our body, and our thoughts to be clean, then we need to stop deliberately putting things in our mind that do not belong there. And they can seem really innocent, like another YouTube video here and there, and a, another random discussion that pops up with some gossip in it, a news article that our, our, 
our eyes catch all the headlinings in the news, a fiction book here and there. And you know what? All these things cause our focus to shift from Jesus Christ to these things. And I remember talking to God and I'm saying, Lord, these are innocent videos. It's just about making soap and it's just about, you know, goats and everything else. Of course, I was watching quite a few of those videos, just not one or two. And he asked me, where is your focus? And I had to admit, well, Lord, I, my focus is on that stuff, not on you. And so those things can seem really benign and innocent, but we kind of have to take track with ourselves. Are we really focusing on Jesus? Have things crept into our lives and become more important to, to us than him? And so those things will cause us to be flooded with darkness, and it will cause us to vacillate between being joyful and depressed, hopeful and sorrowful, full of faith and then full of doubt. And that is where the Bible says that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. James 1 verse 8. Yes, we are being double-minded. One moment we're focusing on the good, Jesus Christ. The next moment we're focusing on something else. And as I said, a double-minded man is unstable because he's vacillating between trusting in God and chasing after him and loving him and pursuing him than to chasing other things and pursuing things that don't really matter and being full of doubt. One moment we're trusting in God to answer our prayers, the next moment we're tortured and full of uncertainties. And we end up like Peter, who he did get out of the boat. He had the word of God in his heart, but you know what he did? He got his eyes on the storm and he immediately started to sink. Immediately, you would think, okay, I can get my eyes on the storm and I can continue to walk on the water. I can continue to have faith. I can continue to have joy, but no. The moment Peter got his eyes on those waves, on the storm, he started to sink because he got him off of Jesus Christ. And so this is a constant walk with us where we have to say, oh Lord, save me, help me to keep my eyes on you. And when Peter saw these winds boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried, Lord, save me. And immediately, thank God, he is so good, Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O oh, thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And some of us, we have the word of God planted in our hearts, but then we also have tons of weeds called the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and the deceitfulness of riches choking out the word. Mark 4, 18 to 20 talks about, and these, these seeds which were in the ground and they didn't produce any fruit, in fact, they were choked out, they are the ones which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it becometh unfruitful. Many of us, including myself, have let things in our lives that choke out our time with God, our hunger for God, our passion for Him. And instead of pursuing to be like Him, we're pursuing to buy another item. Instead of talking and spending time with God, we are spending our time reading fiction books and playing games. And instead of singing to God and being in one communion with him, we are watching secular movies and playing hand games and getting wrapped up in sports and news and YouTube videos and books that do not feed our hunger with God. And you know what? These things are not benign because if they're not feeding your spirit man, they are feeding your flesh. And when our eyes become fixed on these things, we become full of this darkness. And then we don't understand. Why am I so miserable? Like I said earlier, I go to church. I know some verses. I spend time with God. Why am I getting worse? Well, it's because we are feeding our flesh what it wants. And it is growing stronger and taking over our lives. Let me tell you right now, we need to stop feeding the monster. Nefarious, dangerous, insidious, and deadly. It will take what it can get. 
get, get, and keep on drinking more, 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 till there is nothing left, 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 and it's destroyed you to the core. Oh, oh. No matter how you feed it, it's never satisfied. It's always hungry, always starving, and the more you give in, the more it demands of your life. So here's my advice. Don't you give in to the monster. Start that old flesh inside. Crucify its desires. Nail them to the cross of Christ. And don't you feed your fleshly nature. Or we will grow, 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 grow. Till it steals your very soul. So heed my advice. Don't be feeding the monster. You think it's safe. You think it's dead. You take a bite. It rears its head. Then it goes and cries for more, more, more. And if you try to fill it up, 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 you become its slave once more, more, more. Because it can never get enough. No matter how you feed it, it's never satisfied. It's always hungry, always starving. And the more you give, in, the more it demands of your life. So here's my advice. Don't you give in to the monster. Start that old flesh inside. Crucify its desires. Nail them to the cross of Christ. And don't you feed your fleshly nature. Or we will grow, 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 grow. Till it steals your very soul. Oh, 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 oh. So heed my advice. Don't be feeding the monster. Don't you let it watch, watch, watch what it wants to watch. Don't you let it take, take, take what it wants to take. Don't you let it say, say, say what it wants to say. Or do what it wants to do. Or that monster will devour you. It'll destroy your body, destroy your soul, leave you shivering in the cold, and still it won't be satisfied. So heed my advice. Don't you give in to the monster. Start that old man inside. Crucify its desires. Nail the flesh to the cross of Christ. And don't you feed your flesh in nature. Or oh, it will grow, 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 till it stays your very soul. So heed my advice, don't listen to his lies, and don't be feeding the monster. We got to stop feeding the monster, for they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust thereof. We need to call on God to deliver us from the clutches of the flesh, from constantly being distracted by physical things and worries and everything we are facing. In my walk with Christ, he has had to deliver me from so many things that shouldn't be there, from romance books, from worldly movies, HGTV shows that I would spend hours watching, meaningless time-wasting hand games, manga, Asian drama shows, and on and on and on. And no matter how much I partook of those things, I wasn't satisfied. My flesh wanted more, and it wanted it didn't care if the things were getting darker, if there was more perversion in the movies, more perversion in the books. It just wanted more, and I couldn't satisfy it. And it was dragging me further and further away from God and deeper into the bellies of hell. And how many of us are going through the same thing where we're trying to satiate this flesh, and it cannot be satiated? I was always depressed. I couldn't only distract myself from that depression by taking another form of entertainment. And still, I would be miserable. And let me tell you right now, you are no different. You cannot satisfy your flesh. You will be miserable. Your flesh will never, ever be satisfied. Stop buying the lie that a bigger house, a 
fancier car, expensive clothes, a, a diamond rings, or an upgrade pay, or this entertainment, or looking at this image, or doing this, will satisfy your flesh, and you'll finally reach that moment of pure bliss and happiness. Let me tell you, that will not happen. You will never be satisfied trying to fill your flesh. And we're doing a disservice to our Christian brothers and sisters by not telling them this. Because some of them are spending their whole lives in the pursuit of some kind of retirement, in the pursuit of a 401k, in the pursuit of things and having the traditional white picket fence and house and cars and their accomplishments. And many of their prayers are, they're just focused on what their flesh can get and satisfying themselves, but they're blind to the fact that these things will never satisfy them. In fact, the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, verses 10 to 11, He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This is also vanity. When goods increase, they are increased that eat them. And what good is there to the owners thereof, saving the beholding of them with their eyes? Eyes. Ecclesiastes 5, 10 to 11, and Proverbs 23, 4 to 5. Labor not to be rich, cease from thine own wisdom. Wilt thou set thine eyes upon that which is not? For riches certainly make themselves wings. They fly away as an eagle toward heaven. Matthew 19, 23 to 24. Verily, Jesus says, I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again, I say unto you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And Matthew 6, verses 19 to 23, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through, nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness! That set of scriptures about keeping our eyes on Jesus comes right after us storing up our treasures in heaven. In other words, we are not to keep our eyes on gaining stuff in this world and trying to amass more riches. Instead, our eyes are on Jesus Christ in our eternal home, heaven that we will be there with him one day for eternity. And instead of trying to get more purses and shoes and, and makeup brands and Oh, all the other things and tools that we constantly pursue and we're constantly shopping for on Amazon and all the other places, trying to fill the emptiness. Instead, we should be asking God, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to pursue? Lord, what would help me store up treasures in heaven? Because riches will not satisfy us. And fame won't satisfy us. And no matter if we do drugs or we drink or we sleep around or partake of looking at inappropriate images, you will be unsatisfied. In fact, doing these things will actually destroy you. They will open the door to the devil to come in and wreak havoc in your life. Because if you're constantly pursuing more things, then you're letting that become your idol. And all of a sudden, God is not important to you. Mammon is important to you. And these desires, like I said, will lead you on the path of death. And they will tear you apart piece by piece and they still, your flesh still won't be satisfied. At eight years old, I knew this because the Holy Spirit downloaded to me that if people like Elvis Presley and Whitney Houston, who had everything, they had money, they had fame, they had accolades, they had the mansions, they had worldwide recognition, and yet they were not satisfied. And so they were taking drugs to try to deal with that depression, that emptiness inside of them, and they died. I knew that if they could not satisfy themselves through all those things, that I could not find satisfaction through those things. But it took me a long time to really learn to dig for satisfaction in the Word of God instead of just being depressed and wrapping up myself and distracting myself with things. And there are even people who are dying of lung cancer and you still see them smoking. I've even some, 
feeding somebody with a tracheotomy, then their lungs are destroyed and they're still smoking because they're in bondage. They're a slave to those things because their flesh will never be satisfied. The Bible says in Matthew 6, verse 24, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. You can't be serving the world and its mammon and all of its material things and, and its possessions and then serving God at the same time. You can only hold onto one of them. You can't claim that grace allows you to freely keep sinning and clinging to your mammon and that you'll be okay on judgment day. Romans 6, 15 to 16 says, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants are, ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. And John 8, 31, 45, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And then he answered him and said, We be Abraham's seed, and we're never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou, ye shall be made free? Jesus answered them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. God wants us to be free from sin. He wants us to be free from being slaves to mammon, free to addictions from food, free from addictions to pornography, free from the materialistic greed that constantly rears its head in us. We do not need to be like everyone else, pursuing worthly worldly things and pursuing the ways of the world and rushing towards a cliff as they try to attain everything that their heart, which is really their flesh, desires. Instead, we need to call upon God to strengthen us and help us crucify the flesh. Death, destruction, and mayhem. That's where the flesh will lead me, down the pathway of evil, with lust and greed and immorality. And there may be pleasure for a season, but the end thereof is death and destruction. So no matter how it tempts me, no matter what it whispers, I won't listen. And if it doesn't agree with you, Lord, here is what I'll do. Crucify the flesh, whoa, 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 crucify the flesh oh, oh, oh walk in righteousness and do not let it do what it wants to do don't let it say what it wants to say don't let it go where it wants to go don't let it act how it wants to act or think what it wants to think you gotta crucify the flesh oh whoa whoa, whoa. crucify the flesh take up your cross and crucify the flesh selfish self-centered and bitter it's how I was before you changed me, a slave to Satan's devices, in bondage to sin until you set me free. Then you reached down and you saved my soul and gave me strength to overcome. And I am never going back, I am bathing in the light of the sun. And when that flesh rears its ugly head, I won't obey instead. I'll crucify the flesh, oh, whoa, 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 crucify the flesh, oh, 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 walk in righteousness and do not let it do what it wants to do. Don't let it say what it wants to say. Don't let it go where it wants to go. Don't let it act how it wants to act or think what it wants to think. You gotta crucify the flesh. Oh, 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 crucify the flesh. Take up your cross and crucify the flesh. I won't lie. I won't steal. I won't give in to iniquity. I'll crucify, 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 crucify. I'll put aside all hate and fear. I'll repent and walk in humility. I'll crucify, 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 crucify. I will live a life of love and say, Lord, let your will be done in me. And Jesus, help me. Crucify the flesh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Crucify the flesh. Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Walk in righteousness and do not let it do what it wants to do. Don't let it say what it wants to say. 
Don't let it go where it wants to go. Don't let it act how it wants to act. Or think what it wants to think. Eat what it wants to eat. Watch what it wants to watch. You gotta crucify the flesh. Oh, whoa, 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 crucify the flesh. Take up your cross and crucify the flesh. Crucify the flesh. We need to crucify the flesh. I have to crucify my flesh every day, sometimes multiple times a day. I have to ask God to help me not give into my flesh or repent for getting distracted and wasting my time. Even on those things that seem benign and innocent, like watching another pointless YouTube video or wasting time scrolling on social media or overeating when I'm not hungry or eating the wrong foods, because those things, they will steal the plan that God has for your life. He wants you to be going deeper in Him so He can use you mightily. And these things are just causing you to be lukewarm and distracted and wasting all your time. And so I have to ask Him to help me. Lord, help me keep my focus on You. Help me keep my attention on You. Help me to meditate on You. And thank the Lord He promises to help us. That He will help us in our frailties and our shortcomings and the sins which so easily beset us. And this is a verse that He has quickened to me when I say, Lord, deliver me from all these things. He said, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. 2 Timothy 4.18. So if we call on God to deliver us from every work, what he considers evil, not what we consider evil, then he will. And then we can be singly fixed eye on Jesus. And of course, we'll have to fight to do this constantly. And then no matter what we face, our body will be full of light. Ephesians 5, 8 says, For you were sometimes darkness, but now are ye light in the world. Walk as children of light. And Revelation 3, 19 says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So if we ask God to show us where we've gotten our eyes off him, he will correct us. He will rebuke us and chasten us. And he says, I want you to repent and get your eyes back on me. And so he wants us to realize what it means to have our eyes focused on him and have our bodies be full of light. He wants us to get our eyes off the evil, off the circumstances, the problems, the worldly distractions, the lust of the eyes and the desires of our flesh, because those things will fill us full of darkness to where we become so blind that we can't even see what they're doing to us. We can't even see where we're going or how the devil's destroying us through these things and how he's leading us to our death. He wants us blind to the wisdom that God has given us in his word and get us sidetracked. It's our job as children of God to read the word of God, meditate on it, sing it, live by it, speak it, eat it, and do it. I implore you as children of God, please listen. Children, don't let yourselves be pulled away by riches, by pleasures. Children, don't let yourselves be led astray by friendships or peer pressure, for it will end in sorrow. She's calling to you in the city streets. Come away from the sin which will lead ye there down the path of destruction. Oh, children, heed our instructions for the pathway to heaven is the pathway of wisdom. So correction for it will help you grow wiser children in all your ways acknowledge him and he will show you for sure the path you need to follow She's calling to you in the city streets. Come away from the sin which will lead you there 
down the path of destruction or children heed our instructions for the pathway to heaven heals the pathway of wisdom so children listen for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and all evils despise wisdom and instruction for the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and all evils despise wisdom and instruction She's calling to you in the city streets. Come away from the sin which will lead you there. Down the path of destruction, no children. Heed our instructions for the pathway to heaven. Is the pathway of wisdom. So So as children of God, we need to be willing to listen to instruction. And in this instruction is that we need to keep our hearts and minds on Jesus Christ, to meditate on his word. And that is so important because whatever our eye is on, we will follow. So we will either follow after Jesus Christ or we'll follow after the things of the world. And then we'll be a slave to the things of the world, the fear, the pride, the lust of the flesh, the material things, the fantasies, etc. So instead, let's walk in God's freedom. Let's walk in His light. And let's be singly-eyed fixed on Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, thank you for this message, and I thank you that it will go forth and people will hear it and do it, and that it will transform them and change them as they take your word and they will hide it in your heart, their heart, and kick out the things that do not belong there and become focused on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.